Yay, more work. Mm -hmm. Today on Dead Dodge Garage, I want to talk about something. And it's this. Oh, all this. But first, um, my qualifications to talk about this. I've been working on Mopars for 15 years. And, well, most of that time was spent working on junk, but lately, um, some nicer cars have congregated around me. I work at a Mopar specialty restoration shop. This is not an advertisement. I have no horse in this race. I don't know what shop built this car. I don't know who owned this car. I don't know their motives, their knowledge base, their budget, nothing. I have no idea. I'm going off of pictures I saw on the internet and that's it. I like 1968 Dodge Chargers quite a bit to the point that I spent a whole bunch of money on this one. Not nearly as much money as the one we're gonna talk about today, but still a lot. I am not saying my car is perfect. It's not. It's kind of a lipstick on a pig type job, which is what we're gonna talk about. My car is certainly more presentable than the one we're gonna look at today, but that's neither here nor there. Some of what we're gonna look at, inherent charger problems. I mean, the grill's plastic. Things warp. They were never that well built to begin with. They rust. Things don't fit right. That's fine, I accept that. It is what it is. Having said all that, I am not a charger expert. I am not a uh, professional estimator of value. I am just some guy. But I am some guy with a garage full of classic Mopars who looks at them a lot. Now, with all that out of the way, let's circle back to this 1968 Dodge Charger RT 440 automatic that recently sold at Mecham for $170,000. Holy crap! That's a lot of money. Now, the Charger market, as I well know, is insane. A rotten out project car is ten dollars to $15,000. And I mean rough, missing everything. Total pile of junk. Might have a title if you're lucky. Ten dollars to $15,000. That's the price of entry for a semi-buildable car. A somewhat decent-ish 318 small block car that's all complete but a little rough, drivable, seems to go for 35 to 45,000, you know, something like that. I'd say 35 is the sweet spot. A decent ish complete 383 big block car apparently sells for 50 to $55,000. Ask me how I know. Now, a charger that says RT right here, that's gonna command a premium. That's the one everyone wants, the high performance muscle car variant. Did you know that a 318 Charger isn't a muscle car? I had no idea. Of course, if it says Hemi right here, you can throw all this out the window because it's worth a fortune. I don't care what shape it's in. For reference, I know of a sale recently of a 68 Charger RT project car that was complete with a seized original 440, everything under the hood in place, correct, cool. It had power windows and a console, and well, it had regular Charger rust. They all have regular charger rust. That car sold as it was for $35,000, easily. So yeah, I mean, there you go, RT. Now, this means that anyone with a charger RT who wants to make a few bucks, well, they could probably do that. And all they would need to do is spit shine it, throw a fresh coat of paint on whatever's lurking beneath the surface and send it to Mecum. And that's what happened here. Now, there are actually some hints on the surface that something is amiss. For one thing, in the side profile shot, you can see the paint doesn't match between the door and the body. That's not completely uncommon. They painted the doors off the car and it doesn't match right. Okay, fine. But at this price level, I think I'd want the paint on my doors to match. I'm just saying. There's something else too. Where are these lines hanging down toward the ground? That's interesting. Oh yeah, if you didn't catch it in the other picture. The girl's kind of hoo hot and the hood doesn't fit right. Again, fine. Charger, I accept that. But at this price level, shouldn't it be straight? Just saying. 
Now, if I just wanted to pick this car apart all day, I could do that. I mean, there's a lot here to find. There's a split in the steering wheel, but you know, mine split too, it just kind of happens. Where's the trim piece for below the column? Why is everything so disgusting? Why is the frat sog or circle emblem not there, just an open hole? Why does the bezel look like it spent some time at the bottom of a swamp? Now here's a detail I really like. Not only is there an AC duct hanging down here, right at the driver's left foot, but what's that? That is a steering column washer. If it's sitting on the floor, it's not holding the steering column up, is it? Ooh, reproduction radio bezel. I need one of those. Um, there's one screw in it and it's not tight. <sighs> Nothing fits right in this dash either. Again, like, fine. Little details, things need to be fixed. I accept that. I just, you know, at this price level, they spent five minutes throwing this dash together. Th that's all I'm saying. Missing plastic piece, fine. Now again, I'm not here to spend my whole life picking this car apart. There's actually some good detailing work under here. Looks pretty nice. It's got a 134 conversion, so the AC might actually work. That's cool. One down and another to go. <sighs> Mail trucks. Where was I? Oh yes, I believe I was over here. I did say I didn't want to pick this car apart, right? Okay, just a little picking apart left and we'll get to what I really want to talk about. Here's a view of the underside, front of the car. Uh, that's been hit on a piece of concrete and there's a bunch of rust there. Fine, I accept that. What's missing here? Sway bar. This car should have a sway bar. All chargers, of this generation anyway, have a sway bar. You see unused ears here, unused mounts here. Where is it? You want that. Big block car, man, they're a little nose heavy. There are those hoses I was talking about. You know what those are? Vacuum hoses for the headlight doors, which means the headlights don't rotate. Okay, that's a problem. Eh, big block leaking oil, shocking. I accept that too. But what the heck is this? It's a ratchet strap holding up the speedometer cable because it wasn't clipped into the right location and it fell on the exhaust in two different spots, actually. What? I just, uh, okay, fine. What are these zip ties on this chunk of rubber hose? No, you know what? I don't even wanna know. I kind of want to know where this coolant is coming from because again, you know, $170,000 car. I don't care that the exhaust is wrong. That doesn't bother me. Not even a bit. Clearly this is not a concourse restoration, so it probably shouldn't bother you anyway. Oh, hey, um, is that masking tape? Anyway, here's something I only just noticed. The metal strip with the rubber in it on the front window uh, isn't attached to the front window and it just kind of hangs out there. I'm not trying to pick this car apart, or am I? Anyway, yeah, the pie tins backwards. I accept that this car has been restored. I accept that it is not perfect. No car is perfect. Thanks to the messed up charger market and the way the classic car economy in general has gone in the last few years, these things are absolute gold. And I accept that. I love them. Everyone else does too, and I get it. You know, to the point that they sell at Mecum for some so ungodly, they don't even want to tell me. But I do know, thanks to the internet, that this car sold for $170,000. None of that is what I want to talk about. This is what I want to talk about. This is a view, graciously provided by the seller, of the wheel well above the front passenger tire. Uh, sure, we can see things like spray paint boogered over grime they didn't clean. You know what? I accept that too. That's fine. But it's what's over here in this bottom left corner of this photo that really, really grabbed my attention and made me concerned for everyone involved. This is a compression fitting. A compression fitting uses a centerpiece of brass here, two uh, screw on caps on the ends, and in the middle, a small brass collet. When you tighten this against this, it wedges that collet between the two pieces clamps it against the line and holds it together. This fitting has no business being in a brake system, period. Now, over much discussion about this on the B-Body page, 
most people seem to grasp that this is bad. A compression fitting does not belong in a brake system, ever. But you don't just have to take my word for it. I can prove it. Uh, sure, this is just on the Googles. Uh, let's say, for the sake of argument, maybe these numbers aren't exact, but uh, it's pretty close. You'll see about 800 PSI under a normal stop, and you can see as much as 2,000 PSI when you're flooring it for a panic stop and locking the brakes up. 2,000 PSI. That's a lot. That's pretty well in line with numbers I've seen in modern braking systems that have pressure sensors built in. So again, let's say that's probably about right. Here is a specification chart for flare fittings. Eighth inch line, three sixteenths line, 5,000 PSI. And what you need to understand about that is it also has a safety factor built in, which means it can actually hold more than 5,000, but, um, you know, they're not going to say that. Here's a spec chart for a compression fitting of the same size. 400 PSI. Now again, there's a safety factor built into that, which means that fitting may well hold well over 400 PSI. Let's say it's the same as the flare fitting rating, which is a safety factor of 4 to 1. That 400 could, under ideal circumstances, potentially hold 1,200 to 1,600 PSI. Briefly. Okay. I don't know about you, but I don't think I would like to use a could, maybe, possibly, potentially hold together for a little while tubing option on the brakes on my $170,000 Dodge Charger RT. But maybe that's just me. Now. There was much discussion about this on the B-Body page. And several people said, if someone is buying a car that costs that much with that kind of money, they're gonna take it to a shop and make sure everything is gone through and it'll be perfect when they're done and it's not gonna be driven anyway and it's gonna go into a museum. <sighs> okay, fine. But that is a horrible safety issue. Let's say the buyer decided to drive it once before they did that. And that blew apart at 50 miles an hour and they couldn't stop. Let's say a transport truck driver hit the brake pedal a little too hard and that blew apart. What's gonna happen? My point is this. If there's something obvious like this, that the restorer of this car decided, yeah, that's fine, that's good enough, it'll do. What else is hiding in this car? What else is done wrong? What is lurking underneath the surface? Oh, and uh, by the way, also, that line should come under the frame rail and up to here, and there should be a, uh, it's like rubbery stuff clipped in covering that hole. That has a screw cover. That one's flexible stuff. But again, where is it? Here's the driver's side. Not as good of a view, but you can see that cover is in place. No brake line shoved through here. There is more masking tape forgotten on there, though. Huh. The more I look at this, the worse it gets. Now, it was also brought up in that discussion that uh, Mecum is not responsible for this, and I agree. They are an outlet for people to sell their vehicles, and it's not their problem. I mean, really, if nothing else, they give us the evidence here that this car is not what it appears to be. And that's great. Uh, I don't know. I just feel like maybe they should be a little more responsible for vetting what they're selling. But again, it's not their job. I have no idea who put this car together. I don't know if it was the owner of the car who did it in their garage, and I'm tearing apart all of their hard work. I don't know if they paid a shop way too much money to do a bad job. All I know is it was clearly rushed. There's a bunch of stuff not finished. There are some things that are downright unsafe and ridiculous, and yet... It sells for $170,000. I feel bad for the person that bought this car. I suspect they know nothing about any of what I've pointed out, and they just wanted a nice restored Charger RT. That's not what they're getting. Now, people in the B-Bodies group said, if they have enough money to buy a $170,000 RT, they have enough money to go and have it fixed. Well, maybe. I managed to save up and scrape together enough money to buy my dream car. And if it looked like this underneath, I couldn't go spend 50, 60 grand at a restoration shop to make it right. So, yeah. 
I'm not trying to say that these auctions are ruining the hobby. Well, maybe that is what I'm trying to say. I will say it's created a big outlet for shady people to unload poorly finished cars for top dollar. I don't like that. If one person that watches this video pauses before they click bid and looks a little closer at the pictures of well, what they're drooling over, realizes that it's not quite what they think it is and that car doesn't sell, I will count this as a success. There are some obvious things to look for, like, you know, trim that doesn't fit right because rust has been repaired. And there are some not so obvious things to look for, but I don't know, at least try is what I'm trying to say. I don't really care about correct to the letter or factory original or a flawless restoration, but I do care that the person putting my car together cares enough that I survived the test drive to not do things like this. And that's all I have to say about that. Let me know what you think about all this. Am I wrong? I don't feel like I'm wrong. I have done a few pre-purchase inspections on vehicles before. I kind of know what to look for. Maybe you don't, but you should. Don't worry about that, that's fine. I'm gonna get a tray. If you see a car like this listed on one of those big auction sites and it looks suspicious to you, I'd kind of like to know about that. If this has interested you, um, well, maybe I'll do more videos like this, so let me know. Hey, thanks for watching. And remember, you don't weigh in, you don't wrestle. Uh, whoopsie!